From the hero's origins to centuries of injustice, the Dark Knight trilogy possesses a gritty yet fascinating world. Here we'll explore the history of Bruce Wayne and his more realistic rogues gallery, and how three films made us believe a man could, you know, not fly but do wingsuit stuff. In a chaotic world, it can be comforting to imagine that there's a singular force behind history's most horrifying events. Organizations so powerful and secretive that they can hide in plain sight while pulling the metaphorical strings of a society. In the Dark Knight trilogy, those theories would be entirely well-founded, since an enigmatic group known as the League of Shadows has been molding civilization for more than a thousand years. Their theory is that when a great nation becomes too large and decadent, it needs to be purged like an overgrown forest. Secrecy is their calling card, but we're given a few glimpses of the League's actions over the centuries through their leader, Ra's al Ghul. We sacked Rome, loaded trade ships with plague rats, burned London to the ground. His former claim likely refers to the attack on the Roman former capital in 410 AD by the Visigoths, an event that led in part to the fall of the Roman Empire. But Ra's al Ghul further implies that the League retained power through the 14th and 17th centuries. Around the early to mid-80s, a young Ra's al Ghul, then a mercenary for hire, falls in love with the daughter of a powerful warlord. The warlord orders that Ra's is to be thrown into an infamous prison known only as the Pit a deep hole in an unnamed but ancient country. The warlord's daughter arranges to take the place of Raz in exchange for his freedom, never letting Raz or her father know. A few months later, also without Raz's knowledge, she gives birth to his child, a girl named Talia. The girl's mother is attacked and killed by fellow inmates a short time later, and Talia falls under the protection of Bane, a man who spent his entire life in the pit. As a young girl, Talia attains a legendary status among the Pit's prisoners when she becomes the first inmate to successfully escape. While she climbs to freedom, Bane holds back the other enraged prisoners and is gruesomely disfigured in the process. Talia tracks down her father, now a high-level figure in the League of Shadows, and he goes to the Pit, executing the people responsible for his lover's death and extracting Bane, recruiting him for the League and treating his injuries with the use of a mask that continually doses him with pain suppressants. Far away from the pit, on the other side of the world, the League of Shadows' plot to cause an economic collapse in Gotham is thrown off by an unforeseen factor, the rise of philanthropist power couple Thomas and Martha Wayne. Thomas, a celebrated surgeon, is also the chairman of Wayne Enterprises, a technology and real estate development company, as well as the head of the charitable Wayne Foundation. I lead the running of our company to much better men. Better? Wow. More interested men. Thomas and Martha invest heavily in improving Gotham, funding the construction of an elevated train system suspiciously similar to Chicago's L. Ironically, Thomas and Martha succeed in pulling Gotham out of its depression, but only in their deaths. The two are shot and killed in a mugging by a low-level criminal, Joe Chill. The city's elite are inspired into action, helping to clean up Gotham and create a better, if imperfect, place to live, little knowing that this will inspire further, more insidious actions by the League. Joe Chill is hastily arrested for the deaths of Thomas and Martha Wayne, and he spends roughly a decade behind bars. While there, he shares a cell with mob boss Carmine Falcone and manages to glean information on his criminal activities. And that's when Chill decides to become a stool pigeon, exchanging testimony about the gangster for parole. Bruce Wayne attends Chill's hearing with a small revolver in his pocket, intending to kill the man who killed his family. Unbeknownst to Wayne, Falcone has bribed the judge, moving Chill's hearing into a public space so that one of Falcone's assassins can get to Chill before Bruce is able to. After a meeting with Falcone and a slap-heavy chewing out from Rachel, Bruce realizes that he's ill-equipped to stop crime in any meaningful way or protect the people he loves. Now you think, because your mommy and your daddy got shot, you know about the ugly side of life, but you don't. Burning his identification, Bruce goes off the grid, traveling the world in search of meaning, understanding, and mentorship. He gets that in Bhutan, where he's offered membership in the League of Shadows. Told that the League is a force for order, the world's greatest detective doesn't realize that a group of explosive enthusiast ninjas might be in the business of killing people until his initiation ceremony, during which he's told to take the life of a man who's killed his neighbors. Expressing a philosophy of non-lethal violence, Bruce blows up the League's compound, with everyone still inside only managing to save his mentor, who he leaves in the care of a local villager. Bruce returns to Gotham, where he befriends experimental weapons designer Lucius Fox, an employee of Wayne Enterprises who outfits him with equipment to combat the city's criminal element. What's that? On the tumbler? Oh, you wouldn't be interested in that. 
creating the Batman persona and initiating an uneasy partnership with Detective James Gordon, Bruce stops a fresh League of Shadows plot to release a hallucinogenic neurotoxin developed by local psychiatrist Jonathan Crane. Somewhere around this point, Bruce Wayne visits an orphanage funded by the Wayne Foundation where a young kid named Robin John Blake is living. An angry child, Blake recognizes something in Wayne. Anger masked behind a smile. Not a lot of people know what it feels like, do they? To be angry in your bones. Blake feels a kinship with Wayne, looking up to him as a hero figure. He deduces that Wayne is probably Batman, and out of either a sense of respect or an understanding of what bat snitches get, doesn't tell anyone. Blake will grow up and move out of the boy's home, eventually becoming one of the rare, incorruptible cops on Gotham City's payroll. There, he'll partner with James Gordon and become entangled in Batman's world of gritty, animal-based vigilantism. At the end of Batman Begins, Gordon informs Batman that his wearing a mask and generally making a scene has led to escalation from the city's criminal element, with one particularly troubling new figure committing a series of crimes and leaving behind a Joker playing card each time. Nine months later, the man calling himself the Joker is still at large. Plus, at a lower rung on the Calamity Ladder, Jonathan Crane has fully adopted his Scarecrow persona and is somehow making a living selling recreational fear gas, presumably thanks to the fact that teenagers will try anything these days. With public safety at the forefront of the political landscape, a new district attorney is elected, Harvey Dent, a handsome optimist who gives a recently promoted Lieutenant Gordon the leeway he needs to continue collaborating with Batman. Bruce keeps a watchful eye on the new DA, in part because of the lawyer's romantic involvement with Rachel. As the Joker's crime spree picks up momentum, Bruce decides to focus his efforts on stopping the city's organized crime rings, ironically not seeing the threat inherent in a single exceptional dramatic symbol. His war on the mob opens up Gotham's underworld, leaving it vulnerable to the forces of chaos. Do I really look like a guy with a plan? With Batman's attention divided, Joker takes control of Gotham's organized crime, kills a judge and the police commissioner, and reframes the public's perception of Batman. During his reign of terror, Joker kidnaps Rachel and Harvey, killing the former and mutilating the latter, burning off half his face, and driving him into the depths of vengeful homicidal madness. As a result of these actions, Batman pulls his emergency cord, a high-tech surveillance system that creates a three-dimensional sonar map in real time by employing the use of every cell phone in the city. In the end, the Joker is captured, but Harvey's revenge ride concludes when he kidnaps Gordon's family and holds them at gunpoint. Batman tackles Dent off of a ledge, killing him, and agrees to take the blame for the disgraced DA's string of crimes. God needs its true hero. He rides into the night a wanted fugitive, and Harvey's death becomes the precipitating event in the enactment of a series of laws that enable the police to go even tougher on crime, suspending their civil liberties in the name of law and order. During Batman's self-imposed exile, Bruce Wayne works to better Gotham City in ways that rely more on working towards meeting the needs of its citizens by creating a sustainable future and less on punching guys who steal stereos. He helps to fund an exciting clean energy project, but his sense of moral obligation forces him to shutter the experiment after it's revealed that the machine at the center of things could, with a little light tweaking, be turned into a nuclear bomb. After that, nobody sees or hears from Bruce Wayne for three years. But you're not living, you're just waiting, hoping for things to go bad again. The tough-on-crime laws inspired by the death of Harvey Dent called the Dent Act have allowed now Commissioner Gordon to wipe crime off the streets of Gotham, but at a great cost to his conscience. He's drafted a letter of resignation admitting to his and Batman's ruse. He keeps the letter close but stays on the force, mentoring a young officer, John Blake. Meanwhile overseas, the League of Shadows has been reformed thanks to two leaders, Talia al Ghul and Bane. After years of work, the two begin enacting a plan to finish what their predecessors started and destroy Gotham. John Daggett, a crooked construction company owner, brings Bane to the United States in the hopes of taking over Wayne Enterprises. His plan involves a stock market raid and shady business dealings after first employing Bane to help secure diamond mining rights in Africa. Of course, a merry series of mishaps occur. Daggett is killed by Bane, who's been using the businessman's construction firms to plant explosives all over Gotham. In order to protect Wayne Enterprises from a hostile takeover, Bruce hands control of his company to fellow clean energy enthusiast Miranda Tate, who he doesn't yet realize is in league with the League. Bruce brings the Batman persona out of retirement and with the help of a lithe jewel thief, tracks Bane to Gotham's sewers. However, Selina Kyle, the jewel thief, was working with Bane, who's waiting for Batman. He lays a thick layer of the smackdown on Bats, then has him imprisoned in the pit, where he's tortured with a TV view of the destruction of his beloved city. 
With Gotham's Dark Knight out of the way, Bane closes off all land entrances to the city, blowing up bridges and tunnels. Now we come here not as conquerors, but as liberators to return control of this city to the people. He then drops the truth on the public. Harvey Dent was a killer. The Dent Act was unjust, and Bane has turned Wayne Enterprises' clean energy project into a bomb, which will explode when an unknown Gothamite presses the button. The bomb will explode regardless of whether or not it's triggered, but Bane uses the chaos to impose martial law, releasing the criminals in Blackgate Prison and employing Batman's stolen armory of vehicles. For around six months, Gotham is a military state where any crime is punishable by execution. Bruce, meanwhile, is still recovering from his injuries. He learns about the prison's history and makes several attempts to escape the pit, finally sticking the landing the third time. Through unseen means and with no money or resources, he returns to the United States and infiltrates Gotham's blockade. Back in the city he loves, Batman reaches out to the jewel thief who betrayed him before because he has a good feeling about her. Sometimes in a story about a guy who fights crime with animal-shaped boomerangs, you just have to suspend your disbelief. Impossible. With the help of the city's surviving police force, Batman and Catwoman go to war with Bane. In yet another twist, it's revealed that Bane was never in charge of the League of Shadows. He was the Darth Vader to the Emperor Palpatine that is Miranda Tate, aka Talia al Ghul. Talia takes off to protect the bomb, while Catwoman takes the opening and explodes Bane with a shot from the Bat Pod she has on loan. Together, the heroes chase down Talia, and Bruce forces her truck off the road, killing her and really making the audience look back at all those car crashes he's caused over the course of the trilogy with a more skeptical eye towards his no-killing policy. In a final act of bravery, Batman latches the bomb to his snazzy helicopter, making sure we all know that the autopilot is on the fritz and that this is the only way. He flies the explosive out over open water and, with a tug at our heartstrings, blows right up. Or does he? A number of things change in the months following the Siege of Gotham. The public's trust in Batman is restored, enough so that a statue of the Caped Crusader is commissioned. Bruce Wayne is pronounced dead, and a token funeral is held, sparsely attended by Alfred, John Blake, Lucius Fox, and James Gordon, who after years of cooperation, finally pieces together that Batman and the only guy in the city who could afford a custom VTOL aircraft might be one and the same person. The Wayne fortune is left to Alfred. Wayne Manor is converted into a home for orphans and at-risk kids. John Blake, recently having left the police force over concerns with its effectiveness, is left with instructions on how to enter the Batcave. This is where we learn his first name is Robin, implying that he will soon possess the least effective secret identity in superhero history. And then Lucius discovers that the aircraft Bruce flew into that long good night actually had its autopilot functions repaired. Sometime later, Alfred goes to get lunch at an Italian cafe that he'd told Bruce about. There, he sees Bruce and Selina enjoying a meal. Is it a dream? The wishful imaginings of an old man? Or did Batman really escape Gotham to start a new life with Catwoman? Well, since we don't see any Inception-style top spinning, we're going to assume that the Dark Knight trilogy concludes with a happy ending. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.